This is Support is Sexy, episode 142, with Renisha Bing, founder and CEO of Her Agenda. Welcome to Support is Sexy. I'm your host, Elaine Fluker, entrepreneur, author, and founder of Chic Rebellion Media. Five days a week, Monday through Friday, I interview inspiring women entrepreneurs who share their wins and their lessons to help you take your business and your life to the next level and create something sexy. Here we go. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Support is Sexy. I am so excited to have you here. As you know, it just would not be the same without you. And if you are a college student or you know a college student or you're a young woman early in your career or if you're transitioning into a new career, it's not about being young. It's about what stage you're in. I think you're going to love this episode and this interview with Renisha Bing. Renisha is the founder and CEO of Her Agenda, and Her Agenda is um, really creating a space that bridges the gap between ambition and achievement for millennial women. But I do think there is a lot in this conversation that all women can learn about, especially about networking, authentic connections, taking advantage of all of the opportunities that are around us that so many of us don't go after or we're waiting for permission. And Ranisha really addresses all of that in such a great way. So be sure to listen out for all of that in this episode. And what I love too about what Ranisha is doing, she is, and I'm paraphrasing here, really shining a light on businesswomen as the new Beyonce's. So in other words, she's making business women the new sort of celebrities or those to be lauded or admired or the new role models. And I really love this idea of, I mean, of course, I'm a big Beyonce fan. We love Beyonce, but we also love, especially here on Support is Sexy, business women, entrepreneurs, women who are creating something sexy in the world, and we want to celebrate them as well or just as much. So Renisha talks about that a little bit as well. So on this episode, you'll learn why you have to put yourself in the spaces and places that will allow you to meet potential mentors, be completely unapologetic about who you are and what your goals are, why follow-up is everything, and why most people don't do it, what your social media bio should say about who you are. Also, make it easy for people to support you and get clear on what your ask is, and she talks about how to do that. Learn to anticipate people's needs before they even articulate them. Surround yourself with people who see more for you than you see for yourself. And I think that is so powerful. Before you can even almost imagine yourself in some spaces, you should have people around you who are a few steps ahead of you and who can see the potential for you or the potential in what you're trying to create. How to turn those no's into a yes. What Renisha learned about running a business. How she learned to close the gaps and what she needed to learn about running a business. Also, how crucial programs, workshops, and other opportunities are to your success. Ranisha is someone who was just most recently featured on the Forbes 30 Under 30 list, which is a great achievement. And she talks about how programs, workshops, opportunities, and of course, her connections and those things led her down this path where she's able to achieve something like that. She also has a great story about the rejections that you receive along the way. So be sure to listen out for that. Renisha talks about how just one outreach to a contact landed her an opportunity to speak on a panel at the White House and also what entrepreneurship teaches you about your own power. So again, I really think you're going to love this episode. Some great quotes from Renisha in here that I certainly took down and I'm sure you will too. So without further ado, Renisha Bing. So Renisha, thank you so much for joining us for an episode of Support is Sexy. I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to talk to you. Excellent. So first question, when did you first fall in love with entrepreneurship? I I don't know if I really chose entrepreneurship. I think it chose me in a way mm -hmm. because of my personality. I'm just the type of person that just likes to take action. I don't like to wait. I have no patience and I'm very much a self-starter. And so if I have an idea I just really feel most of the time, like, why not do it now or why not create it now? And so I think that that lends itself very much to uh, 
an entrepreneur, like you're always thinking about how to solve problems and you're not waiting around for someone else to solve them. You're thinking about how you could solve them. So my really first step into entrepreneurship was journalism. And not a lot of people think of journalism in the way that it's uh, like being an entrepreneur, but literally you start the day with nothing. And by the end of the day, you have a completed story. In order for you to have that story, you have to do research, you have to make phone calls, you have to literally put the pieces together for it to happen. And that's the same thing with the company. You have to pick up the phone, send that email, come up with the idea, shape what it is that you want it to be. And it's on you to make it happen and no one else. Exactly. Now, when did you first become really interested in journalism? Well, I really feel like journalism is my calling. And Mm -hmm. I discovered this at 16. I took a journalism class in high school by mistake. It was just like an elective that I took just to fill up my schedule. And at that moment, everything clicked. I said, wow, you could have a career doing something where you get to be the first to know information, you get to be nosy, you get access to Mm -hmm. people who are empowering, you get to hold them accountable, and you get to write about it. I I was just sold completely. Like Every aspect of what I was good at, every aspect of my personality personality really came together within the field of journalism. And so that's how I discovered it and how I got started with it. So tell us about your personality. What was uh, a young Renisha like growing up? Where did you grow up? I am from Brooklyn, if you can't tell. A lot of people say that they can't hear my accent anymore. Oh, originally from Brooklyn. Nice. Uh Mm -hmm. What part of Brooklyn? Actually, the funny thing is there's a a song called Brooklyn Girls, and I'm mentioned in this song, which is so crazy. So I'm like also a part of hip hop history a little bit. (laughs) When is the song? When was the song Brooklyn Girls? Now I got to find it and link to that. What year was the song Brooklyn Girls? This was in 2007, Mm -hmm. right when I was graduating high school. And it was all over the radio and people would text me all the time. I heard your your name in a song on the radio because he was signed at the time. It's a rapper named Charles Hamilton. and He was signed to Interscope Records. So it was a big, trendy hit. It was like how Soldier Boy was everywhere at the time. This was everywhere. Oh, my gosh. Did you know him personally? I guess so. Oh, yeah. I met him um, a few years ago when I was in high school. I was doing a journalism program called Harlem Live. And it was the first online teen newspaper. And it was run by a man named Richard. And he ran that program like it was a newsroom. We would come in, put our stuff down from school, and he would say, okay, this is happening. You need to go out and cover it. So I was able to cover like Gordon Parks' funeral because mm-hmm. I came in one day and he, so I put my stuff down. He's like, Gordon Parks' funeral is happening at Riverside Church. I want you to go cover it. And I went. And was able to interview like Lenny Kravitz about the legacy of Gordon Parks and so many people. And at the time, I'm 17 at the time, and I didn't even know who Gordon Parks was. And I looked him up right before I went, and he's this legendary photographer. Right. And so I, at the time, I didn't even realize how valuable those type of experiences were. And now I'm looking back like, wow, I was a teenager who covered Gordon Parks' funeral. That's amazing. Um, but that's how I met Charles. Because filmmaker. He, yeah, he's the legend. Mm-hmm. So I met Charles um, when I was in that program. They ha- they hosted open mic nights and they had different poets come by. And so he would do spoken word po- poetry. And so we met there and then really connected and kept in touch because I was blogging at the time on Blogger. And he started to follow my blog and he was just very supportive of everything that I was doing in terms of paving, paving my own path and starting my career in journalism and things like that. Did you always love writing when you were younger? What drew you to journalism initially or writing initially? I was someone who read all the time. I would read a book a day. I started reading chapter books when I was in first grade. And I loved to write, too. I would write poems. And whenever we had an assignment for school, um, I remember one time in junior high school, the teacher... um, For my dance class, she would make us go see Alvin Ailey um, every winter and write a reflection paper. So the requirement was about two to three pages. I would end up writing like six to 10 pages, (laughs) a a reflection piece on Alvin Ailey. And so at that point, she is one of the first people who identified me as a strong writer. She's like, you really have something here. Not every 12 year old or 11 year old is writing an analysis like this. And that 
pushed me to think about joining like the junior high school newspaper, but I, it wasn't really a formal newspaper program. Um, and then when I was in high school and I took that elective, it really all clicked and came together. And it's a different type of writing journalism, but it's still writing. And I was comfortable with, you know, putting sentences together and I had a good um, handle on the English language, which is a skill. It's something that I think I take for granted because it comes naturally for, t- for me. But now that I'm running my own media company and my own platform and I manage interns and I manage contributors who are new to writing, I realize, wow, you really have to grow this muscle of writing. It's not something that's just like easy to do. Mm-hmm. For some people, it comes easily. But for others, as you said, it takes practice and, and really mm-hmm. flexing that muscle over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what were some of your greatest influences or who were some of your greatest influences growing up? Oh, my gosh. So the cliche answer at this point, but at the time it wasn't cliche, is Oprah. Mm -hmm. Obviously, she uses her platform to empower people. She started out as an on-air reporter and then eventually became a talk show host and eventually started to own her own company. And I just really appreciate her just her willingness to empower others using the power of media. So much of media, people say, like, is driven by negative news and people seem to be drawn more towards, like, you know, clickbait type content. But she stayed true to herself and and really took the higher path of using media as a tool to teach and to empower and to show people that life can be better. And so she was definitely one of the ultimate inspirations. And then I've been lucky, like super lucky to have really, really great mentors along my journey. Um, One of my very, very first mentors was Rakia Mays. And I interned for her when I was in high school. I was 16 at the time. And my number one goal was to get an internship. I had I was in Harlem Live. I had done um, a lot of workshops. NYU has a high school journalism workshop. The New York Association of Black Journalists has a high school journalism workshop, and I had done both of those. And I was just really interested in getting that real world experience to be in a newsroom or to be at a magazine. And no one would accept me as an intern because I wasn't in college. Everyone said you have to be in college to to intern. Mm -hmm. And so I met Rakia because she came to speak at Harlem Live one day, and I said, okay. She is a radio DJ and she's running a magazine. She was the managing editor of a magazine called The Ave. And she's just doing everything that I want to do in media. She's worked in magazines. She's on air. And so maybe she needs some help. Maybe I can intern for her. So I walked up to her and gave her my card. Yes, I had business cards at 16. I was about to say, did you have business cards at 16? Yes, I I love it. business cards. I I went to Vistaprint, put my name (laughs) on there, my email address, and shipped them to myself. And I would give them out all the time. So she just was blown away because I had a business card. I was just very serious about you know, getting started in the industry. And she let me intern for her. And it was an incredible experience. So she was one of my first mentors. Um, And then also Ty is one of my mentors. She's someone that I look up to so, so much. And she's opened the doors for me for so many opportunities and just really like behind the scenes gives like really great advice. And just even when I don't speak to her on a regular basis, just her example of just looking at how she carries herself and how she is building her career and what she does and what she takes on and and how that unfolds to the public and also getting a little bit behind the scenes of like what that really like is like in terms of negotiating deals and whatnot. It's just, I'm super lucky that I've been able to be around women that are not afraid to empower others and open the door for other people and give back. So. Excellent. And for everyone listening, Ty is Ty Beauchamp. So I'll make sure I have a link to the episode that she did with us. Ty is a great friend of both of us. So very powerful. woman. And Rakia. Rakia, I've known for years. In fact, I'm trying to coordinate a, a conversation with her. So really, oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, really great people that you've um, that you've been men- mentored by. And I would ask you, obviously, mentors are important to you. But do you think and would you advise people to seek mentors like in the case of Rakia you said you went up to her you had your business card at 16 and there are people even today who are afraid to go up to people and say hey this is what I'm interested in doing is there a way for 
me to be, well, I don't know if you said mentor to Rakia, but she ended up being a mentor. You said be Mm -hmm. an intern, right? So what would you advise women listening of how to approach people who could potentially be mentors? I would say you have to put yourself in the places and spaces to come across women that you would want to be your mentor Mm -hmm. and then be completely unapologetic about who you are and what your goals are. And I would say not to ask for them to be your mentor. That can be a little Mm off-putting. And it's a big title and responsibility to put on one person if it doesn't emerge organically. So with Rakia, it was, an organic relationship that evolved because I started out interning for her and I asked her to to be, I asked if I could intern for her. And then with Ty, how she became my mentor, I was, like I said, part of that workshop um, with NYABJ and she came on as one of the, the lunchtime mentors. So she just came to just be in the room and introduce herself. And she came up to me because she saw I was the anchor of the program that we put together and asked if I wanted to model in 17. So she gave me her card and I actually followed up. Most of the time people will give you their card and they say, you know, keep in touch, follow up with me. And they don't because they feel like they don't have anything to say Mm -hmm. or they feel like they don't have anything of value to give. And so I knew at that point, like I had nothing to lose. Like why I, she offered me something I'm going to follow up. And so then that just led to us developing a relationship organically. So I think when it comes to finding mentors, if you are passionate about what you want to do and you are clear about it, then mentors will come to you and those relationships will form organically. Um, I always say most people want to help you, yes. but you have to tell them how to help you. You yeah. have to eliminate the process of them trying to figure it out because no one's going to sit there and say, oh, wow, Ranisha. I don't know. I just met her and she's great. Let me see what I can do to help her. It's like, no, I met Ranisha. She's a young, passionate journalist. She's looking to get her start. She wants to do X, Y, Z. I know someone who is working at People Magazine who's looking for new interns. I'm going to introduce them. So make it easy for people and you make it easy by like showing up in those places, being clear about what your goals are. And also social media too. I didn't have that back then, but Now, on your social media bio, anywhere that you are online, like people should immediately be able to categorize you and understand like what it is that you're about. Excellent advice. Excellent. Do you think uh, I I love what you said, too, about making it easy for people? I always say one. Tell me what you need. Mm -hmm. The key words, words that I love to hear from people, because then you can say. And I think for the person that's being asked that being clear, as you said, on what you're what being clear on what your ask is. I always say, try mm-hmm. to reach out to person, especially someone who's busy or who said, hey, get in touch with me, et cetera. If you're reaching out, not just to say hello, which is okay too, but clear on what's one ask that you're asking of this person instead of a long paragraph about what you're doing and that kind of thing. Can, how can a person help you being clear about that? Have you found that that's been helpful for you too? Yeah, that's been super helpful. And then also, it's not just asking, it's also being really, really open and and observant to mm-hmm. know what that person might need anticipating people the people's needs before they are able to articulate them especially someone who's above you so one of my mentors is a woman named Erica Erica Kendrick mm-hmm. and she used to run an organization in New York called NABMEN which is the National Association a National Association of Black Female Executives in Music and Entertainment and so she was someone that I was just blown away by like the same way that people look at celebrities like Beyonce. That's the way that I look at these women who are accomplished and amazing and just doing their thing. So at the time that I met her, I just realized, wow, she has a lot going on. Like she might need some volunteers to help at the next event. So I anticipated a need and I asked her if I could come and help volunteer. The funny thing about her is that she is very open and receptive to who people are. And she told me to never, (laughs) never um, volunteer to do something um, for free. And I'm like, what? What do you mean? I'm just Mm. getting started. But she just she really started to manifest the whole idea of me being more than what was where I was at that moment. So she started calling me a mogul at that time. She would call me mini mogul. (laughs) And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? But she pretty much manifested that because, I mean, I'm not a mogul, but I am running my own media company today. So she saw that in me before I saw it in myself. 
How was that important for you in that moment? Maybe you didn't realize it in this that moment, but thinking back now, that um, someone like her, who you admired at that time, to see that in you, did it cause sort of a mind shift in you, just how you thought of yourself? Oh, yeah, definitely. It means so much. That's why mentorship is important and teachers are important because for someone else to believe in you that has no obligation to tell you that you're great or amazing it is so affirming and just gives you that confidence to get started and to put yourself out there and to think bigger once you start to open yourself up to thinking bigger and exploring the possibilities of who you could be beyond what you even thought Mm -hmm. it's powerful it's beyond powerful so when you went to where did you go to college did you go to Spelman no I went to DePaul University I um ended up going to DePaul because of this scholarship program that I was in called Posse. Mm -hmm. And did you study journalism while you were there? I studied communications. It was a liberal arts school, so they didn't have a specific journalism major, but I studied communications. Did you have a sense at that time that you would start your own business or what was your plan while you were at DePaul? Um, When I was at DePaul, my plan was to eventually become an on-air reporter. Mm-hmm. And so I was interning at NBC and I, um, when I was there, I, I knew that I wasn't going to get the experience that I needed on campus per se, because media, I realized early on was very relationship and experience driven. And so I, since I had started before I even got to college, I was just very focused on cultivating those relationships and really um, starting to freelance and and get more actual work experience rather than focusing on school clubs or campus organizations. And Mm so I ended up, because I had already had a blog and on Blogger, I knew sort of the mechanics of putting together a website. And so it was in 2008, I was a sophomore that I decided to launch her agenda. I had been thinking about it for a while. I um, recognized that there was a need for a platform that increased the visibility of a different type of role model that wasn't a celebrity and also gave women access to resources and opportunities. Um, And so I had this motto that was my personal motto, essentially, no one ever slows her agenda. And it's more so like a mindset of whatever your goal is, just go for it and don't let anything stop you. Even if someone tells you no, find someone else to ask or keep asking until eventually it becomes a yes. And that mindset and mentality I realized was not common amongst my peers, especially women. And then I was taking a lot of women's studies courses and learning more about the gender gap and the lack of women in positions of power. And I was really compelled to do something. And I realized that I could use the power of the internet, the power of media to do that. And so it was in 2008 that I created Her Agenda out of my dorm room. And that was essentially my campus activity because instead of being on the school newspaper or in clubs, I was just in my room contacting people um, and setting up the things I needed to do in order for the website to exist. Excellent. Now, did you build the website yourself at that time or what was the, how did you, what was the first step when you decided, Um, okay, I'm going to do this? The first step was to find a web designer. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to, I wanted it to be more than a blog. I wanted to, I wanted it to be a platform. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that you needed some type of coding skills or background in order to put that together. And so my first step was to look for a graphic designer web developer and so I found one and then I actually realized oh wait I have to pay them <laughs> I don't <laughs> right. have any money gonna say, was this so, a friend or yeah no I mm-hmm. it wasn't a friend I wish it was mm-hmm. but I ended up he didn't charge me too much money it was about two thousand mm-hmm. dollars and so, so what I college did, at the time right yeah so what I did was I actually created t-shirts that said no one ever slows her agenda on it and sold them to friends and supporters and people who followed me online and I was able to raise the money mm, excellent so innovative I love it now tell us what her agenda is all about okay definitely so her agenda is a digital media platform that works to bridge the gap between ambition and achievement for millennial women. And so on 
the platform, we showcase the real stories of women who have achieved their goals and overcome barriers. And we also have stories about how to navigate the workplace, how to find a mentor, how to negotiate your salary, how to manage up those things that they don't teach you in school about making it as a professional. And then we also have couple that the content with access to resources and opportunities that help our readers get on the path that they need to be on in order to achieve success. So one of the aspects of that includes a database of panels and conferences and networking events that are coming up because I really, especially because, you know, my story, as I was explaining, like meeting all these amazing people, I think it's really important to be in the room, Mm -hmm. but you can't be in the room if you don't know that it exists. And so this is the answer to that. And so I, essentially realized too um I'm only one person so I'm in New York a lot of the events were New York events and I'm like okay there has to be other girls in different cities that are like me that are always in the know of like professional events and opportunities and so we created a program called the Her Agenda Event Curator Program where we have girls in different cities adding these professional events and resources to this data database so it's a true true community collective effort. Why was it important for you to focus on or really establish a space for millennial women? Um, That's just what I know. I think that I understand this generation and the mindset that we have and the struggles that we have. Um, I think speaking to older women, I don't necessarily feel like I'm the right person to give them advice per se. And I believe that as we grow and evolve, we'll eventually start speaking to the next generation, to Generation Z and whatnot. But right now, the generation that's at the brink in terms of stepping up and Mm -hmm. stepping into power is millennial women. Excellent. And but you feature all kinds of women, all different ages and everything on the site. But like you said, you folk that's your focus as far as your the women you serve. Yes, exactly. Now, how does the platform, would you say, how does it nurture you? as a founder? I think just the people that are part of making it happen. So my team, we're all remote, but we speak to each other every day through Slack. And they are some of the most inspiring, incredible, smart women that I've ever come across. And a lot of them initially came on board volunteering before we were able to be able to pay them. And so they inspire me every day. And and sometimes when I don't feel like doing something or if I don't have an idea, they will come into my inbox with like the most incredible initiative or program or idea. Um, Something that they came up with recently that I'm so excited about is the campus ambassador program. Mm -hmm. For a long time, I wanted to do something with college girls, but I didn't want it to be a program that didn't add value to them and their experience. And and there's a lot of campus ambassador programs that pretty much take advantage of students. So I'm like, how can we create something that would give them value? And they came up with a phenomenal program that allows them to contribute to the site, allows them to put on their own professional events on campus. So I'm super excited about that. And then all of our readers, like I I hear from them all, all the time on Twitter, Whenever I have an event and I see them and I get to talk to them and hear about how her agenda changed their life, to me, that's a very strong statement. But it's something that's been expressed to me number a number of times, and I don't take that for granted. Excellent. Now, for the Campus Ambassadors, is that a program or an initiative that you've launched already, or is that something you all are working on for this year? It's something that's up now. So the the call for applications is up right now, and the deadline is January 19th. Okay. And then we will roll it out starting February 1st. So how can people find out about that if they hear this before the deadline? They can go on to heragenda.com, and the homepage has the application information. Okay, on the homepage. Excellent. So I'll make sure I link to that. Fantastic. Now, you've received such wonderful accolades for her agenda. And were recently, as we talked about before we started recording, recognized on Forbes 30 under 30 list. Congratulations again. That's Thank fantastic. you so much. Absolutely fantastic, which was a beautiful surprise for you. But what would you say has been um, the biggest surprise about this journey? Wow, that's a good question. The biggest surprise... I would say the biggest surprise was how much I didn't know about running a business. And so I knew a lot about being 
a content creator and being a journalist and running a content driven site, but not necessarily just because you have those skills to, to launch a site and, and tell stories and publish content does not mean that you have the skills to be an entrepreneur. Mm. And so the most surprising thing was just, yeah, literally what I did not know about things like cash flow and investment and raising money and paying other people and all the things that have to do with actually running a business versus just having a hobby or a brand or a blog that you don't look to make money from. How did you end up learning those things? Because I think for a lot of people, if they know, well, sometimes we move forward without, what is it? You don't know what you don't know. It mm-hmm. sometimes works to our advantage, right? Because you've moved forward and then you find out. But for those people who may be letting some of those things hold them back, how did you go about learning some of that once you figured out that you didn't know? Well, the first thing is I immersed myself in the startup world and the entrepreneurship community. And so I started working out of a co-working space that had other tech founders and startup founders to learn more about what it takes to get the capital that you need in order to run a company. Or also, once you have the capital or once you start to make money, like what you need to do with it and how to allocate it. Um, But then I took a deeper dive into it when I got into an accelerator program. It's called Points of Light Civic Accelerator, Mm -hmm. and they had a specific cohort that addressed companies that are building solutions that empower women and girls. So it was the perfect program for me to learn not only how to articulate my vision and my mission, but also to figure out the financials. They took us through how to create a business model, how to do a financial forecast, how to create your pitch deck for investors, all of that type of stuff that you could spend hours on the internet Googling. But this program took me through it from the beginning to the end. And it's called Points of Light Civic Accelerator? Yes, Points of Light Civic Accelerator. Okay, I'll make sure I look that up, see if we can link to that as well for people who want to find out more. Now, in speaking to you, it seems like since you were, I don't know, a baby, but certainly since you were 16, (laughs) you um, knew the importance and the value of getting involved with organizations, workshops, or things like this, even more recently, the Accelerator. How important has that been to your success to find these different programs or outlets that could support you in some way? It's been honestly incredible. I don't know where I would be without these programs. Any program that was out there to help me, I found out about it and applied for. So if I sat here and explained all the programs I was in, you would think I was crazy. And like, (laughs) when did I sleep? But But how did you find out about them? Just research? It was honestly just because of my network. People Mm. would just tell me about things. And it goes back to what I was saying before about being unapologetic about what your goals are so that pe- when things come up, people think of you and they will forward you that email or they'll send you a text or they'll recommend you for something without you even knowing. And so with Posse, for example, I found out about that because of my aunt who's a teacher and she always knew that I was a great leader and I did well in school. And she said, you know, this, this scholarship is for leaders. It's a leadership scholarship. Maybe you should check it out. And then with um, all those programs I did in high school, it was my journalism teacher, and he pushed me to get into all of these programs. So, yeah, it's just people around me in my network. And that's another reason why I started Her Agenda is because I realized I've been lucky enough to have these people around me to tell me about these programs, but not everyone has this network or not everyone has a mentor. And so just because you don't have the right network doesn't mean that you shouldn't have a chance at success. Um, There's a quote that says, you know, talent is everywhere. Opportunity is not. And so with her agenda, with us putting out these resources and opportunities into your space and, and sharing them on social media, we're hoping to sort of change that where, okay, we know that millennial women are incredibly talented and deserving. Let's try to lower the barrier of entry in terms of giving them access to opportunities. Excellent. And I think, too, for people listening, just to know that also when that opportunity is there, you have to take action. And I think that's one of the great things about you and your story from the time, again, since you were a teenager, you took action. So it wasn't like, oh, I'm only 16. I can't fill in the blank or, oh, I'm not ready yet. And that kind of seems like you a person who's like, great, okay, I'm going to try for this. 
And yeah, if they, you know, so many people tell themselves no before other people tell them no. I yes. wait for someone else to tell me no. If I will continue to do things until people say, mm, you're actually not supposed to do that. And I'm like, oh, really? I didn't know. <laughs> it's that you don't wait for permission. <laughs> exactly. Yes, because you have an agenda. It all ties in. I love yes. it. <laughs> Excellent. And it's funny because I think agenda sort of has like a negative connotation. No. It's like, oh, they have like oh, he has an agenda. When people say that, they usually mean it in like a negative sense. But mm-hmm. I think it should be positive. Like Absolutely. let people know what your goals are and why you're there. And so that eliminates any type of assumptions or any bad tension that would arise because your intention was one thing and that other person's intention was something else. I think that's such, uh, such a great point to bring up. And I think because of the things, these things that we apply to things, because as you said, an agenda is not a negative thing. You think about if you were setting up a meeting or something like that, you send someone an agenda so everyone has an idea of what the focus or the intention is supposed to be. And having that for yourself is certainly something important. And as back to your advice earlier, it lets people know sort of where they can fit in or how they can support you. At least that's what I view it as. Yeah. Great. And then always just keep, and and again, I think too, with opportunities, it's like putting yourself in those places and spaces. So something that else, another program that really helped me a lot was the Emma Bowen Foundation. Mm -hmm. And this is a program where you can start interning at top media companies like NBC, Fox, Channel 11, I think Hallmark, and they pay you and you get scholarship money. It's a multi-year internship where you come back every summer and you just work in a different department. I found out about that literally the day before the application was due. Mm -hmm. I was in um, the newspaper office and a girl was printing an application that was about 50 pages. And it was annoying to me because I needed to print my story to edit. And then I looked at the page and I saw all these um, high profile media companies listed on the side. I'm like, wait, what is this? And at the time I told you I was really like targeted at getting an internship at a major company. And Mm so I was really intrigued by that. And she told me about the program and she's like, yeah, the application is due tomorrow. So I went on the website, printed the application, ran around my whole school and got my recommendation letters, got my transcript. And that also speaks to like, you know, really being the type of person where someone will like drop everything for you because you're deserving of it. Mm -hmm. And so I was a good student. I treated everyone well. I always, you know, went above and beyond for assignments and things like that. And so when I asked for something like that at the last minute, I was able to get that out of them because of the type of work that I had done previously. Excellent. And I think, too, not to get too woo-woo, but the fact that you were in that space where you were looking for an internship, I don't know, maybe you didn't know where it was coming from or you hadn't landed on it yet, and then you happened to or not happened to were designed to be at the computer or the printer, rather, and you see this form coming out and you see these companies and you ask about it and you find out it's the the internship or the opportunity that you were looking for and then you spring into action. So I think a lot of us too don't at least keep the question in mind of what you're looking for. You don't know the answer right away, but you, as you said, had a target or an intention. I'm going to get an internship at a major media company. Yeah, exactly. Excellent. So for your business, um, I was curious, you mentioned earlier that you have some people on your team. How big is your, your team? We have three to five people who are on the team full time. And then we have a network of contributors and Mm -hmm. they're freelance part time. And there's about 100 girls in our contributor network. Excellent. So what is your model? You don't have to give us exact numbers, but what does your model look like as far as revenue? Is it through membership or is it through investment or how do you how did you manage it to get it to this point where you can hire people? There's a few different ways. So one is a subscription service that we started. We host a community on Slack. So any girl who is a her agenda reader that loves the content but wants to really take it to the next level and connect with the writers behind the scenes and get access to essentially me as a founder and all of the resources that I have in terms of connections and access to the hidden job market is what I call it, like those emails that you get from a friend that works at a company that's hiring a position they haven't posted it publicly yet Mm -hmm. and so it's really cultivating that mindset of shine theory like everyone in this group and community has the mindset of like if you win we all win another way that we make money is through sponsor posts and so we do a certain number of sponsor posts per month and also we do live events so with our live events we charge for tickets and we are able to make money through tickets Excellent. So is um, being in the the agenda 
group, is that something that's open to the public or how do people become involved in that if they're interested in finding out more? Yeah, so you essentially go onto our platform, HerAgenda.com. The last tab to the right says subscribe. Mm -hmm. And then that brings you to the sign up page for this community. Excellent. Great. Now you have so many powerful quote. Well, you have powerful things that you say that are so, so quotable on their own, but you also have powerful quotes on the Her Agenda Instagram, which is at Her Agenda for everybody listening. And we'll have links to that. But one that I noticed from Lisa Skeeter Tatum Mm -hmm. says, um, you've got to be willing to take a risk, a calculated risk. You've got to put yourself out there. So when is the last time you took a risk and put yourself out there? And what lesson did you learn from taking that risk? That's a good question. Mm-hmm. I would say there's so many. I'm the type of person where I do things and then I sort of forget them because I'm so focused on the next thing that I want to do or that I, I have in mind or the bigger picture. But I would say I t- a lot of the things that I do, people would consider risky, like in terms of the type of people that I reach out to or the type of the type of opportunities that I sort of set myself up to do. So I remember last year I was very intrigued by what the White House White House was doing. I I saw a lot of my friends and peers were going to the White House for panels and conferences and forums. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what is happening at the White House where all these people are going there? Like, what are they doing? I want to see if I could possibly help or be involved. And so I had a friend that used to work for the White House and I sent him a text and I said, hey, I actually would love to talk to someone at the White House about how her agenda could be involved and help. And he then put me on email with the executive director and she asked to speak to me on the phone. We had a call and then she's like, what are you doing next week? And I'm like, Whatever I'm doing, I could change my plan. I'm going to the White House. She's like, okay, well, we're doing this forum talking about um, issues that millennial women face today. And I would love for you to be on the panel. Wow. And I'm like, oh, my God. Okay. At the time that she said that, I literally knew that I was equipped and I was prepared. But I felt like, oh, my God, me? Mm, I felt like there needed to be be a like a process or maybe I was like did she look me up I don't know she knows what I do really like what makes her think that I'm good enough to speak on the panel at the White House about millennial women meanwhile I run a platform for right. millennial women right. I, that's at my whole everything so why would I not be that person but for me that felt like a risk because it's just like well what if I mess up what if I'm not ready it was streamed on the White House website so many people were watching and then that Taking that risk led to another big opportunity that I felt like, oh, my God, am I ready for this? Um, For the actual United State of Women Summit, I was asked to speak. And so I thought I would be on the panel again. But this time next to my name, it said moderator. Mm. And I was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) Moderator. And so I moderated this panel about building inclusive movements and communities and empowering them to take action And it was a panel of about eight people, which is pretty challenging, even as a skilled, even a skilled moderator with years of experience. But I just really worked hard to prepare myself and and it worked out. Wow, that's a that's a great story and great example. I think, well, one that you reached out to your friend again, taking action at the White House. What is going on? How can I be of help? Is there some way I can get involved? And then saying yes, when the woman asked you to come the next week to be on the panel or and even though, as you said, you may have had this moment of imposter syndrome or feeling afraid or that kind of thing, but you did it anyway. And then being a moderator, you did it anyway. So thank you. Those are Excellent examples. So proud of you. That's so wonderful. Thank you. So what would you say your support network looks like? Oh, my gosh. My support network is honestly incredible. It's maybe at least 100 or more people Mm. (laughs) between the organizations that I've been lucky to be a part of to just all of the women around me that just look to help and to to really advise me. I'm part of a... um, Google group is essentially like a bunch of, of women on email called the list. Mm-hmm. And that network has been beyond incredible. These women have 
a lot of us haven't even met each other in real life, but it's just because you're part of this group. Like if you put an ask out there, someone will answer you mm. in, in terms of giving a resource or making a connection. And so I've gotten so many opportunities from that. And the founder of that group is a woman named Rachel Scar, who's been a long time um, journalist. And she started out as a lawyer and then transitioned to become a major figure in media. And she's just like honestly changed my life. Um, I was also part of a group and you're part of it too, Black Girls Rule. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, that's a group of women that I remember when I was first starting out and one of my other mentors, Nicole Duncan Smith, she said, hey, do you know about this group, Black Girls Rule? And I was still in high school at the time. I'm like, no. She's like, okay, well, you should come with me to this dinner. And I was able to meet all of these women who were editors at magazines and writers for like major publications. And that really helped me a lot too, as a young person, because it goes to that idea of you can't be what you can't see. Mm. And so I was able to see these women that looked like me who were editors at Vibe, who were writing for the Associated Press and it was just incredible. So really my network is mostly filled with women. There's some men in there too that help, but really it's a, a lot about the women that are around me that help me. Excellent. Now I'm question: have you ever, was getting a quote unquote full-time job in media ever something that was in your thought process or was it as soon as you started her agenda in college, you knew that this was going to be the thing that you put all of your might behind? Um, that's a good question. I felt very conflicted as a college senior about Mm -hmm. whether or not I wanted to take on a full-time job and I honestly wanted to come straight out of college and work for myself Mm -hmm. but that's not how it happened I ended up because of all the hard work I put in as an intern of course when it came time to graduate NBC wanted to hire me Mm -hmm. and so I didn't necessarily apply for jobs literally the job came to me and then as a young person just starting out it seems really silly to turn down a full-time job that you didn't even have to apply for or search for. So I ended up working full-time in media um, right after I graduated college. And I honestly, even though that wasn't a goal of mine, and I really had a lot of moments where I was unsure if I wanted to continue because I felt a little bit like I was being untrue to myself because Mm -hmm. I'm like showing up every day. And when you work in corporate, you have to really sort of have that idea or give that idea off that you want to be there for a long time and that Mm -hmm. you want to move up. And and I knew that I didn't want to stay there for super long, but I did see the value in the experience. I was able to figure out how corporate America works and learn how to work with people on a day-to-day basis and navigate corporate and office politics, which is a whole, oh my goodness, there's so many little rules and things that you cannot learn other than experiencing it. And so it was a really, really valuable experience for me. Excellent. And then how long were you there before you, did you go from there to focusing on your business full time or did you move to other places? No. So I was there for a little over a year and then I went to the Huffington Post and I was writing for their Black Voices section. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So what would you say then throughout this whole journey that entrepreneurship has taught you about yourself as a woman? Entrepreneurship has taught me that anything is possible. Really, um, there's there's th- there's walls that you will hit, and you just have to keep getting back up. It's really about the number of times you get back up. Um, I've applied to so many different programs and and opportunities that I get rejected from. I get rejection emails in my inbox all the time. You get more rejections than the wins. Like there's. There's only one for 30 under 30 moment. But then before that, there's like 20 other lists that come out that don't even acknowledge you or even programs and accelerators that I applied to that I constantly got rejected from. There is one that I even flew out to San Francisco for. I was a semifinalist and I was sure that I was going to get it. It was an accelerator focused on media startups that mattered. And so it was like if you had a media startup that was like changing humanity in some way and making it better. They wanted the, that type of company. And I'm like, that is my company. I was 100% confident that I was going to get it and I, that I flew to San Francisco in person to do the semifinalist interview and I didn't get it. Mm. And then the next day, like you get a rejection email and then the next day you have to turn around and moderate a panel or 
or do an interview. So it just has really taught me that I have more power than than I realize in terms of being able to just put my game face on and keep going no matter what happens. Excellent. That's wonderful. So, Ranisha, if you think over your life and career and you had the chance to thank only one person whose support was critical to you personally or professionally, who would that be and what would you say? I would thank my mom for giving me the freedom to do all the crazy stuff that I used to do Mm -hmm. as a kid. I mean, I would sometimes be out at, you know, events and industry events and stuff like that till late at night. And she trusted me so much that she let me do what I needed to do in order to get to where I am today. And so I would say thank you to my mom for trusting me as a young person and believing in me to the point where she didn't ask me too many questions about all the random things that I had to do and things that I had to do sometimes for free. I remember she always did ask me like, are you getting paid for this? Right. But I'm like, it's about the experience. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Now tell us how we can support you. What are the things that we can do? Of course, I'll have links to everything. And thank you for this fantastic list of resources here. I may have to contact you to make sure I got spelling of everything right. But tell us about your website, social media, any other things that we can support you with. Definitely. So definitely read heragenda.com every day. We publish new content all the time. Click on the stories, share them with your friends on Facebook. It really, really helps to really spread the word about what we're doing. And then you can find us on social media at Her Agenda on Twitter and on Instagram. We also have a Facebook page. And I would love for your listeners, if they're looking to give back to a community of women if they're looking for direction in terms of their next steps to really consider subscribing to our community on Slack called The Agenda. And they can find that on Her Agenda's homepage, the last tab to the right that says subscribe. Excellent. And I saw that um, you were offering two weeks or something, a discount. You mentioned? Yes. Okay. When you sign up, you can get two weeks for free. We're doing that for a limited time. I'm not sure how long we're, we're going to do it for, but it allows you to get into the group and see what it is about and see if it's for you before you commit to actually paying the month, monthly fee. Excellent. So every- The monthly fee is re- very low. The monthly fee is like essentially like the cost of two coffees a month is eight ninety five. Right, so what you pay for Netflix and all these other things that aren't serving you in the same way, entertainment exactly, but not not uh, edifying you in the same way. So everyone, be like Ranisha, take action. Be sure to do that today. Thank you so much for you. You've been fantastic. So much great advice and so many quotes that I'm sure I'll be posting and crediting to you. But I really appreciate you, and I appreciate all the work that you're doing. You know, I'm all about women supporting women, and you've been doing it for a long time so thank you for the work that thank you, do. you. Yes. thank you absolutely. and we would love to feature you too so definitely i'll be in touch about making that happen absolutely for sure thank you and now before you go you've given us great advice but just a parting piece of advice from you to our listeners about anything one of my favorite quotes and this is not an original quote from me but it's literally the best thing to keep in mind as you move forward and set new goals and put yourself out there Feel the fear and do it anyway. Feel the fear and do it anyway. I love it. Renisha, thank Mm -hmm. you so much. Hold on just a second. All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode with Renisha. To see all of the great contacts and resources that she mentions in this episode for all of the organizations and workshops and just different things you can look into or get involved in, be sure to go to supportissexypodcast.com. Again, supportissexypodcast.com. Search Renisha. R-H-O-N-E-S-H-A and her show notes page will pop up with all of the links there. Also, why don't you go to supportissexylove.com that's supportissexylove.com and take a look at our fundraising campaign for Support Is Sexy. The goal is for us to reach $20,000 to continue the production and providing value and inspiration to all of you wonderful women entrepreneurs out there. So go to supportissexylove.com check it out. Check out all of the great rewards. If you can't donate, at least share the project on your 
your social media, I would really appreciate that. Or if you can donate, of course, I will appreciate that too. Either way, I so appreciate you being here. It means everything to me and of course to the show. And as I always say, it would not be the same without you. So now you know what to do. Go out there and create something sexy and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.